Okay, so I've mentioned that during the um, the years after Augustus, for roughly 150 years or so, um, the Roman Empire was at its height, but after that it went into a decline. Now there are some 210 reasons at the last count as to why Rome went into a decline. Uh, one of the most prominent historians to write on the matter, Edward Gibbon, the author of the book uh, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, um, viewed Christianity's rise after the crisis of the 3rd century as directly responsible for the decline and fall of Rome, sapping the martial vigour of the army and diverting funds away from state necessities to increasing the poor. My own view is a bit different and um, I'll try to outline the two key factors that I think destroyed um, Rome. The first is the plagues and the second is the army. Now, it seems a bit odd to describe the army which had done so much to defend Rome from its enemies to um, build the aqueducts and the roads at the heart of the empire that enabled the trade to take place to be responsible for the destruction of the empire. But I'll get on with my explanation and um, you'll see where it leads. Now, the first part is the plague. Um, plagues began to hit with increasing severity from the reign of Marcus Aurelius onwards. Um, so he was the stoic philosopher emperor we discussed earlier on. Um, and during his reign, the Antonine Plague struck around 160 to 180 AD. And there were further worse plagues afterwards, which um, reduced uh, the population of the Roman Empire greatly. It's estimated perhaps by up to one third, and which especially decimated the Roman army. Now, getting into how the Roman army destroyed Rome, the Roman system had in effect been erected on a bed of nitroglycerin, um, and it's partly due to the uh, adroitness of um, Augustus that this wasn't immediately obvious. Although Augustus had taken control of Rome primarily through use of the army, he was very keen to downplay his uh, position as head of state. So he, bought, he built a relatively small house on the Capitoline Hill um, and he put the Senate, which was previously a, um, a legitimate body of Republican Rome, um, back into a seeming position of power to try to downplay the fact that Rome is now really a military dictatorship. Um, but in reality this structure existed and as long as respect for the office of emperor existed, the system is relatively stable, as long as the army could be held in check. But because of the severities of the plague, um, the army was meeting with limited success in the north and in the east, and following Emperor Alexander Severus's disastrous defeat by some German tribesmen in 235 AD, he was assassinated by the army. Now you remember, the state had rested on the power of the army, but if the army decided that it was more efficient to, um, or more in its own interests rather, to um, ask the emperor for a pay rise and assassinate him when he didn't give it, rather than going out and really in and keep fighting the Germans or the Parthians, um, things quite quickly would degenerate. There's a period of great instability where many generals thought that they were good enough to uh, be Caesar, and unfortunately, uh, it created a vicious cycle which destabilised the empire, leading to utter chaos. Um, it's interesting to note that after the 3rd century, the um, Roman sculpture, the most visible sign of the civilization, greatly declined, perhaps partly due to um, plagues which tended to um, affect city centres where the few craftsmen were living more. Um, now, in my opinion, the rot had set in long before the real rise of Christianity under Constantine. It's certainly during this crisis of the third century. Um, the crisis was followed by a period of stability under Diocletian and later under Constantine. And I think it's in the reforms of Diocletian that you can see part of the reason why Rome didn't rise again. 
Now Diocletian faced two major challenges when he was acclaimed emperor in 286. The first was the utter chaos that the army asking for pay rises had caused. The currency was completely debased and the army resorted to simply requisitioning foodstuff from the Roman peasants, which naturally didn't make the peasants particularly grateful towards the empire. So Diocletian decided to raise taxes and reform the state bureaucracy to ensure that the army had a constant supply of funds and therefore wouldn't need to wreak havoc among the peasants. In doing so, he started to tie people to the land, which gave the beginnings of uh, feudalism which would come to dominate Europe during the Middle Ages. It was now harder for ideas to travel. Um, it was harder for individuals to travel. People were bound to the land and some of the vitality was sucked out of the uh, Roman economy in the long term by these large taxes. These taxes were necessary to fund a very large army. I mean, the population of the Roman Empire as a whole had decreased due to the plagues and the constant infighting, but yet the territory remained and there needed to be sufficient men to garrison it, leading to a case of what's known as imperial overstretch. The second issue that Diocletian faced was that um, there had been a lack of respect for the office of emperor. And the way that Diocletian was to restore respect was not as Augustus had implicitly done by having the might of emperor rest on the claim to the loyalty of the army, but instead having um, respect for the emperor rest on religious respect. Um, and Diocletian in the short term was successful with this, it meant that um, he was able to retire peacefully and live a prosperous life. Um, so Diocletian was a pagan and he persecuted Christians heavily. Uh, the religious emphasis he sought to legitimize his reign was as an agent of Jupiter for himself and for his co-emperor as, um, as an agent of Mercury. But it was his successor Constantine um, who sought to legitimize his claim to the throne um, through Christianity. Now, the Christians had offered a form of social support network. The early Christians were almost communists and they shared all their goods and all they had, whether they were rich, whether they were poor, with each other. And this form of support network had proved remarkably resilient and popular during the utter havoc of the crisis of the third century, especially amongst the Roman soldiers. So by Constantine ordering his soldiers to paint um, the Chiro Christian symbol on his shields before uh, his big showdown against um, the rogue co-emperor Maxentius at Milivian Bridge. Um, he gained the support of many of the soldiers and many of the laity. But at the potential expense of making the Roman Empire um, even more superstitious um, than it already was, and because of the large emphasis on the importance of the priestly class, um, potentially, as given indicated, uh, sapping some funds um, for, uh, and intellectual manpower from the real pro uh, problems facing the Roman Empire. Now, Constantine did do something which was very useful for the Roman Empire. He founded a new capital at Constantinople, at Turkey, and you remember one of the key problems that Diocletian faced was this lack of manpower. Well, this in effect got rid of the issue of imperial overstretch by forming um, the core of the empire in the east around this new capital of Constantinople. He defected a more permanent solution to the imperial overstretch problem. And from 383 onwards, as the Romans retreated first from northern Britain and then from the west of Europe entirely, um, this enabled the rump states of Rome in Byzantium, around modern-day Turkey and Greece, to survive for a third of a thousand years.